Part 1. A phone conversation about booking a venue for a private event. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 10. This is George and Dragon. How may I help? Hi. I'm calling to inquire about your upstairs venue. I'm interested in booking it for a private event, and I was wondering if I could ask a few questions. Yes, of course. Just give me a second, please. So, before we start, could I please get a name and phone number? Yes. My name is Clara Carlton. Carly, um, could you spell that for me, please? Sure. It's C-A-R-L-E-T-O. N. And the phone number? Well, I'm going to give you my work number as I'm booking the venue for a work event. Right. So it's 020-8322-1479. Great. So what would you like to know? Well, I saw on your website that the price can be from £20 per hour, so I would like to get an exact quote if possible. Well, the price depends on the type of event, the date, and the number of people, and whether we will be providing food as well. Oh, it's for a retirement party for one of my colleagues. OK. And for which date is that? Well, we were thinking next Tuesday, the 31st of May. OK. Oh, I'm sorry, but the venue's already booked that day. We're free on Monday and Wednesday, if that would suit you. Well, Wednesday's no good, because the gentleman who's retiring will be gone by then. But Monday works just as fine. Great. You'll get a cheaper rate for Monday, too. Excellent. And how many people will there be? Well, at the moment it's supposed to be 16, but it might go up to 17. We're waiting for one of our co-workers to confirm whether they'll be available that night or not. The boardroom in the venue only has space for 15 people, I'm afraid. We've got enough standing room for about 15 extra people. Is that all right? Oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. We won't be sitting down much anyway. Would it be possible to provide two extra chairs just in case, though? Yes, of course. Great. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions. And finally, will you be needing us to provide food as well? Well, we'll be bringing the cake, but I imagine that yes, we will be ordering some food as well. What are your options for nibbles? Well, we've got quite a vast selection depending on which type of menu you're interested in. We've got meat-based tapas, as well as some vegetarian and vegan options, and we've also got some sharers. Well, as far as I know, none of us are vegans, so I don't think we'll be needing that. Some meat-based and vegetarian options would be great, though. Would you like me to talk you through them, or...? Well, you do have the menu online, right? Yeah, you can find it on our website. The only thing is that a couple of options have been removed and replaced with new ones, and we haven't had the chance to update it online yet. OK. Let me just pull it up on my screen. Just a second. All right. So, in the meat-based food section, the dishes that have been discontinued are the mini fajitas and the pulled pork bruschetta. Oh, that's a shame. The pulled pork bruschetta looked really nice. Yeah, but we've replaced them with two new really popular dishes. We've got a trio of sliders, which is three mini burgers, made one each with chicken, beef and pulled pork. And we've also got ham and cheese croquettes. Oh, that sounds nice. So I'll have seven of the mini burgers then. I see you've also got vegetarian croquettes. Are they still in the menu? Yeah, we've got the vegetable croquette and the potato croquette. And how many croquettes are there in each dish? The vegetable one is five, the potato one is four. OK, so I'll have two of the vegetable croquettes and 
I'll also have two of the ham and cheese ones, please. Great. Anything else? Well, I don't know. It all looks so nice. What would you recommend? Hmm. Well, what I would recommend is the simmered squid. It's slow cooked in wine and served with potatoes. I'd also recommend the hummus platters. Our chef actually makes his own hummus, and it's one of our most popular sharers. And of course, all of our salads, especially the Caesar salad, we're famous for them. Right. So I'll go for five hummus platters, or should I get six? No. You know what? Five is just fine. I. I won't be having any of the squid. It sounds lovely, but I'm just not sure how popular it would be with my colleagues. Yeah, fair enough. And finally, one Caesar salad and one vegetarian, the goat's cheese one. Great. And just for the final question, for how many hours would you be booking the venue? Well, we'd be arriving straight after work, so somewhere around 7 p.m. And I'd expect we'd need it until at least 9 p.m., maybe even 10 p.m. So. So three hours? Well, probably. But let's make it four, just in case. Right. Great. So just give me a minute, and I'll get back to you with a quote. All right? Yes, of course. Um, hi. So I spoke to my manager, and the total with the food and a drink starter for seventeen people would come up to three hundred and eighteen pounds and ninety-five pence. Okay. But he'd be happy to offer you a five percent discount, which would bring the total down to just three hundred and three pounds. And that includes a pint of any beer, a glass of wine, or a fizzy drink for each person. Okay, that sounds reasonable enough. Let's go for it. Right. So I would just need a deposit of. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk about keeping children safe on the internet. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Thank you for coming. It's good to see so many of you interested in keeping your children safe on the internet. What's in store? Well, firstly, I'm going to talk in general about some common sense ideas and rules for young ones using the computer. Then, I'll give you some information on free educational websites. Finally, we'll finish with question time. I'm sure most of you think that the internet can be a frightening place in which to let your children roam loose, but let me remind you that it can also be a fountain of knowledge and education. The trick is to avoid the former and utilize the latter. There are programs available both in your local electronics supply shop and free to download that will keep your child safe to a certain degree on the World Wide Web. A popular one is Online Family Norris, which bars things like military and social websites. I wouldn't advise you to rely solely on a program to protect your family, though. As good as it is. You cannot abdicate your responsibility as a parent. I'm sure you all know that, or you wouldn't be here. When all is said and done, the the best way to keep children safe is to educate them and keep an eye on them. For this reason, you should make sure the computer which your child uses is kept in a communal space, where you can look over their shoulder from time to time. It is paramount that you teach them. 
never to divulge their proper or full name, and to never provide personal information, such as where they live or what their phone number is. Tell them that online friends must remain just that, online, unless they are supervised. It is difficult, I know, to teach children about the dangers of the world when they are so naive, so trusting, and innocent. But without going into great detail, you must alert them to the possibility that the people they are chatting with may not be who they say they are. It's also sensible not to give them their own email address until they are old enough to use the internet safely. So all communication from websites will go through you. When they are old enough to use social sites like Facebook and MySpace, teenagers need to know that whatever postings they put on the web will remain accessible forever. Nothing is ever really deleted there, and embarrassing pictures or remarks may come back to haunt them one day. For instance, when they apply for a job, they could jeopardize their chances as the employer or human resources staff will look on the web to find out more about their potential employee, and they may be shocked by what they find there. Not the sort of stuff an applicant would want on his or her CV. It can also make them more vulnerable to bullying. Unfortunately, bullying on social sites is another thing to look out for, and I have to tell you, it's on the increase. It's a very difficult issue to deal with, but something that is more easily detected if the computer is kept in a family space. If we can put these negative issues aside, let's not forget that the internet is also a wonderful place for children of all ages. Teenagers may be mostly networking on social sites or completing research that they've been asked to do as part of their homework assignments, but younger children can get assistance with mathematics, spelling, and reading on a variety of free. And paid for sites. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. A good way for children to learn and have fun at the same time is the website MathTutor.com. They can practice mathematics on this site, no matter what their level, while they compete against other children from all over the world. And here's a fun way for primary school children to learn the spelling words for the week. It can be such a chore for some children. They just type them in and play games to learn them. What's that? The website? Oh, sorry. Yes, you'll need to go to spellcity.com for that. The one I'm going to tell you about now is one of the most practical sites that's popular with people of all ages. Children, or parents for that matter, can learn to touch type as they sing along with songs. And there's a variety of funny characters to help you enjoy yourself as you learn. In this day and age, typing is essential. Everyone should be able to type fast and accurately. So, go to beeb.co/typing and try it out. Don't just leave it up to the kids. Here's a site that parents can use to download worksheets. To extend their children by giving them further practice, it's called CoolResources.com, and I can really recommend it, particularly for middle school students. Now, are there any questions?
That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for twenty years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university, even with the change in your everyday duties? I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television program last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon, then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip, Professor Nitik. Could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> An average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon, and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions twenty-seven to thirty.
Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of two thousand and one. There you have it. My next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer in the art history department. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. In this lecture today, I'm going to introduce you to an American painter, Charles Wilson Peale. You may be familiar with his portraits, but did you know that he never even saw a painting till he was a grown man? He was born in Maryland in 1741. His father died when he was nine, and the family struggled financially for the next few years. And Charles became a saddle maker's apprentice. One day he went to Norfolk for supplies, and there he saw paintings for the first time. He thought they were so bad that he felt sure he could do better. So he decided to make painting his career. In 1766, he went to London to study painting with Benjamin West. Whilst there, he painted this portrait in 1768. See slide one. Pitt as a Roman senator. Notice how elaborately symbolical this portrait is. The symbolism arises, of course, from Pitt's famous speech to the British Parliament, where he draws an analogy between the ancient Roman Senate's view of a barbaric Briton and the prevailing European view of the time of a barbaric African continent fueling the slavery trade. Perhaps you didn't know that the Romans used Britons as slaves, but I digress. Back to Peale. He returned to America and, in 1772, painted the first ever portrait of George Washington. See slide two. In 1773, he painted a group portrait of himself, his wife, mother, brothers, sister, his old nurse, and an unidentified baby. Just look at the slide. This painting is simply called the Peel Family, and you can almost feel the exuberance of the family and their warmth towards one another. He enjoyed great success as a portraitist prior to the Revolution and served with distinction in the Revolution. During this time, he became friends with George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. After the war, he continued to paint, and when his wife died in the 1790s, as a result of her eleventh pregnancy, he remarried. He had seventeen children in all, naming the sons after famous painters or scientists. Although perhaps best known for his portraits of famous people, Peale liked novelty. Look at this slide of his two sons, Raphael and Titian. 
life-size, climbing a narrow stairway. This painting, The Staircase Group, 1795, was exhibited in a doorway as a trompe l'oeil, and it is said that it did, in fact, fool the eye of George Washington. Even as far back as 1772, we can see his desire for difference in Rachel weeping. It's a rather macabre portrait of his first wife crying over the death of one of their children, their daughter Margaret. I'd like to show you one more slide to demonstrate his innovative approach. This is a portrait of his brother, James, sitting at his desk at night, with only his face illuminated by a lamp. This was painted much later than the others, in 1822. You know, Peel believed anyone could learn to paint, and he taught painting to his brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, nephews, nieces, and other relatives. Four of his sons, Titian, Rubens, Rembrandt, and Raphael, became painters, as did his brother James. Before I finish, I'd like to tell you a bit more about Peel. He was active in politics for several years, and throughout his life he maintained a lively interest in many branches of science. He was also an inventor who gained patents for a fireplace, porcelain false teeth, and a new kind of wooden bridge. He collaborated with Thomas Jefferson on what was known as the polygraph, a kind of portable writing desk. But it wasn't any ordinary desk. This one could make several copies of a manuscript at once. He also wrote papers on a wide variety of subjects, from hygiene to engineering. Oh, and he also tried his hand at inventing a fairly primitive but innovative motion picture technique, new types of eyeglasses, and a velocipede, which is a precursor to the bicycle. Now, some of the original velocipedes had pedals and some didn't. You sort of scooted along on them using your feet. Unfortunately, I can't remember which type it was that Peel worked on. He's also remembered for his work as a naturalist. He established the first scientific museum in America, and he even invented his own system of taxidermy. For those of you who aren't sure what taxidermy is, it's the art of preparing, stuffing, and presenting dead animals so that they appear lifelike. He was also well ahead of his time in that he placed his animals in a simulated natural environment. His most magnificent exhibit, however, was the complete skeleton of an extinct mammal known as a mastodon, which he helped excavate. The event was memorialized in his extraordinary painting, The Exhuming of the Mastodon. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.